Good morning to everybody. I'm Strobe Talbot, and it's my great honor this morning on behalf of all of my colleagues here at the Brookings Institution, and in particular, Ambassador Martin Indyk, who is the Vice President and Director of our Foreign Policy Studies Program, and who presides over our Statesman Forum, to welcome you to what is going to be, I think, a quite extraordinary event. We all know what an honor it is to have Prime Minister Erdogan with us this morning. I want to say a word in a personal vein, if I could, and I direct this both to you, Mr. Prime Minister, and your family, which is so well represented here. Mrs. Erdogan, the two daughters, Esra and Sumera. We here at the Brookings Institution like to think of the institution itself and the community that it's part of as like a family itself. So it is particularly meaningful that all of you would be with us on this important occasion. The Prime Minister is also accompanied by a diverse and distinguished delegation. It includes a number of Turkey's most successful executives and entrepreneurs who have been part of the engine of Turkey's extraordinary economic dynamism. He has with him in his entourage also a number of leading figures, columnists, and editors from the Turkish media, and senior cabinet ministers and government officials. One member of that entourage, the prime minister is off, sent off on another errand somewhere, and that's Foreign Minister Davidoglu. Would you please give to Ahmet uh, Hojum our very deepest greetings? He's been a friend of this institution, like you. He has spoken here before, and we wish him all the best. Now, I think that everybody here today knows that the Prime Minister had some intense, quite long meetings with President Obama and other officials of the United States government just yesterday. They had a lot to talk about. The United States and Turkey share interests not just in a very important and troubled region of the world, but globally as well. In that region, of course, we can all be certain that the President and the Prime Minister talked about Iraq, Syria, the greater, greater Middle East, and beyond. But our two governments are also working together on global issues as well, in multiple forums, including, of course, the G20, of which we are both members. Since this is the age of globalization, it is also the age of geoeconomics, which is another reason to appreciate the progress that Turkey has made in recent years. It is one of the most robust economies in Europe. It's the 17th largest in the world. During the 10 years of Mr. Erdogan's premiership, Turkey's economy has grown three times, and government debt has been cut in half. That's enviable on the part of a number of countries I can think of around the world, including the United States of America. I might add that just as the world's leaders are focusing very much on Turkey, so are we here at the Brookings Institution. We have a Turkey project within our center on the United States and Europe, and that project is under the direction of a distinguished scholar, Kamal Karishi, who holds our Tusiad Senior Fellowship here at the institution. And we are delighted that President Ilmaz of Tusiad could be here with us today. After the Prime Minister speaks, Kamal Karishi will moderate a question and answer period. There are uh, translation sets at most of the seats in here. There will be simultaneous translation. English is to be found on channel two, Turkish on channel 10. And those of you so inclined, and I know there are a, a number of uh, tweeters here today, I'm looking at the Indian ambassador, Ambassador Rao, who has about one million followers. You are invited to follow on Twitter and to contribute 
to the discussion in the Twitter sphere of what is going to be a terrific speech and an excellent conversation to follow. So, Mr. Prime Minister, you now have the floor, as well as our attention, our respect, and our gratitude to you for you and your family being with us today. Sayın Başkan, distinguished chairman, distinguished scholars of the Brookings Institute, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I greet you. I uh, was here approximately three years ago with our valuable friends and we discussed then uh, what uh, the important topics of that day, and we had a Q&A session which was uh, quite um, interesting at that time. During uh, our tenure in government, which covers a period of ten and a half years, I'm very pleased to be once again with you here in, at Brookings Institute. I will talk to you about uh, the AK Party governments and the transformation of Turkey. And, uh, we will have an opportunity to have some conversations and discussions when you oppose me uh, questions. Brookings has a history of uh, close to 100 years, and uh, it is a very important institution through the analyses, the reports that it prepares and publishes, and the scholars who uh, work at uh, Brookings. It's a, indeed an important institution which sheds light to many uh, political and economic issues on a global scale. I would like to express uh, my thanks to the Brookings Institute and its administrators and uh, its staff for the work that they're doing with respect to the valuable products that they provide to the world public opinion. We, too, follow the work of the Institute very closely, and we appreciate what you do here. Distinguished friends, the Republic of Turkey was built on the foundations of an old and rich civilization and an old tradition of state uh, in 1923. There, we have established, our ancestors have established many states throughout history, but uh, the Seljuk and the Ottoman Empire states uh, covered a um, vast geography, and they lasted longer than uh, many of the other um, states that were established in the past. And so their uh, heritage was very important in the shaping of the Republic of Turkey. So Turkey has this uh, age-old um, tradition of uh, state, which I think is very important, and that puts Turkey in a very different position in a regional context. So the reflexes of Turkey with respect to emerging um, regional and global uh, issues uh, is based on this historic heritage and experience. The First World War was indeed a war which uh, ended up having major consequences for Turkey, for our people. What I can tell you uh, is that, um, as an example of what happened after the World War, First World War, what I can tell you is that um, the geography of uh, Turkey changed a lot. If you look at the Ottoman past, uh, at one time the uh, Ottomans uh, covered an area, the Turkey was in an area of 20 million square kilometers. But after the First World War, the new Republic of Turkey found life in an area of 780,000 um, square kilometers. This was the initiation of a new process uh, in 1923, and there were two important challenges at the time. One was the situation of the states uh, neighboring us, uh, most of whom uh, were former Ottoman territory. For example, the Palestinian issue is an issue 
which emerged, emerged after the fall of the Ottomans. There was no such issue before that. So this dimension of the Palestinian issue uh, is therefore something that is of great interest to uh, Turkey. So um, this is the answer to the question uh, as to what Turkey's interest is in the Palestinian issue. Another um, challenge for the new republic was to um, bring together um, different ethnicities um, that lived in the 780,000 square kilometers with the masses that came from the previous 20 million uh, square kilometers. And the Republic successfully managed to uh, bring uh, people coming from different parts of what was the um, Ottoman Empire in the past, and uh, this was based on the experience of the Seljuk and the Ottoman states. And the first um, assembly, which was established in 1920, brought together different colors, ethnicities, and differences of Turkey, and it was all done in harmony. And, and, uh, Gazi Mustafa Kemal used to say that the Kurds, the Laz, the Gurjus, the Georgians, and he talks, he, he lists all the ethnicities in uh, Turkey and says that uh, the new assembly is a bringing together of all the different uh, parts of the Islamic community together. This was how he defined the first assembly, which was established in 1920, because it included all the ethnicities, different different religious groups, and they got together in the first assembly in 1920 with the aim of living together in peace, and uh, they worked together towards the same goal. My dear friends, the Republic of Turkey has been established on the principle uh, that uh, the source of sovereignty is the people. Unfortunately, in the 90 years since the establishment of the Republic, there have been times when uh, there were serious difficulties. Elections were held, governments came to power, and uh, this was a manifestation of um, sovereignty, but the civilian and the military bureaucracy at times considered itself above politics. And so in that sense, we had quite a challenging 90 years. These 90 years were were a period of which uh, was spent in trying to establish democracy fully, and there, were, there has been a lot of discussion about sovereignty. And we, the challenges that we uh, were faced with uh, created certain uh, consequences, and we faced certain uh, trauma in our domestic politics, social life, and foreign policy. And in the same way, the um, togetherness, the spirit that uh, brought all different uh, walks of uh, society together and in the establishment of the republic suffered from this. So. Uh, we have had some uh, more difficult uh, times. We did have some uh, important and positive developments, of course. We uh, gained a lot of experience. Uh, we managed to gain a lot of important experience in a very turbulent region, a difficult geography, and in a country which is predominantly Muslim. Ten and a half years ago, um, elections were held on the 3rd of November 2002, and this became a very important turning point in the history, 90-year history of the Republic of Turkey. I am very proud to say that the last ten and a half years has been an important period where there have been great achievements with respect to democracy in Turkey, and uh, Turkey has achieved advanced standards, and uh, we have achieved irreversible, uh, we've made irreversible progress uh, and at the time, and at this time, and we also strengthened uh, the sovereignty of the people. Some people. Um, could not accept this fact. They still sometimes do not accept this fact. But we have a government in place which believes in progressing democracy further. And as a result of this major transformation in politics, law, economics, and foreign policy, Turkey has become a regional and global actor. Some observers call this a silent revolution. This ten and a half years has been indeed quite um, challenging and difficult at times, but we were always determined to uh, achieve progress, and we did what was required to achieve the progress we were envisioning. 
So in this path towards advanced um, democracy, we also considered uh, and took into consideration the um, economy. We did not want the economy to lag behind. Our planning was always geared towards advancing the economy together with our democratic standards. We wanted to, the two to go hand in hand because we believe that this is the only way we can uh, take our country further. We, throughout this period of 10 years, we uh, also tried to resolve some of the uh, decades-old issues in Turkey. We provided and made investments which were not made in the past, we provided service to the people. But at the same time, we also stood against attacks on democracy and uh, law and national uh, sovereignty. The AK Party governments led, therefore, a great transformation in Turkey. And, uh, in every election uh, that we participated, uh, our votes increased. There were three um, general, two uh, regional elections, and two referendums, so seven elections in a period of 10 years. And we uh, were successful in all of these elections. This shows the uh, success of a, a government which unites with its people. Because we uh, do not represent any single ethnicity or any single region or uh, any uh, made-to-order um, government that was uh, designed somewhere else. We came from the people, and we uh, are uh, carrying out our processes and policies with respect to uh, the people in accordance with what is required for further development. And we have always represented the 81 provinces of Turkey. Our, we, were, we have been present in the 780,000 square kilometers uh, of Turkey, in all of Turkey, in other words. And, uh, we uh, represent uh, all different aspects of society of the 76 million people who live in Turkey. The meaning and function of politics in Turkey therefore changed in Turkey. The legitimacy of politics uh, now comes from the people, not from the elites of the state. Uh, it comes from the people, from the conscience, from the learning and history of the people. We have engaged in a number of activities uh, with respect to strengthening democratic institutions. We carried out legal reforms, we provided uh, equal opportunities in democratic and economic development, we focused on research and development, health reform, the uh, efficiency and uh, the strength of uh, Turkish foreign policy and uh, the work of uh, non-governmental organizations. All these policies have been very important in raising the bar in the political and social life in Turkey. This has been our vision, and we are determined to pursue this further. Turkey uh, was suffering uh, the largest economic uh, crisis in its history in 2001, 12 years ago. But as uh, Mr. Talbot also said, Turkey has now become the 17th largest economy in the world, and we are the sixth largest economy in Europe now. Before uh, arriving here in the United States, we um, announced an important development uh, to our people. Turkey had become a member of the IMF in 1947, immediately after the IMF started its uh, work. And since 1961, Turkey has had a um, relationship with the IMF whereby it received uh, funds and loans. Turkey owed to the IMF um, 23.5 billion dollars uh, in 2001. In other words, at about the time uh, when we came to government ten and a half years ago. During our tenure in government, we, when we spoke to the IMF, we uh, told them that they should not insist on some uh, policy uh, proposals uh, when we were pursuing our government policies. We told them that they should um, determine the timeline for the loans that they would extend to us, that we were prepared to talk to them about the terms of that loan, but we would not accept their um, intervention in our uh, policy because uh, we are politicians and we decide our policy because the IMF or its people are not uh, the politicians who pursue politics in our country. That's why uh, we did not end up having uh, standby agreements. 
in the last uh, 19 years, uh, there were 19 standby agreements in to total, but we did not uh, carry out any standby agreements with them. And we paid back the $23.5 billion, and on Tuesday we paid the final tranche of the um, debt we owed to the IMF. No, we now no longer have any uh, debt we owe to the IMF. So this uh, is finished. And this we have done at a time when we all uh, observe uh, this, uh, the effects of the global finance, financial crisis. So this was indeed a great uh, achievement, so much so that we are now in negotiation with the IMF to lend to the IMF. And if, when these negotiations are complete, it may be possible that uh, we lend uh, up to $5 billion to the IMF. So this is the way things have reversed. A few, I'll just give you an example of uh, the kinds of developments that took place in the Turkish um, economy on the 3rd of May, just uh, a few days ago. When we came to government, the Istanbul Stock Exchange, uh, which now became Borsa Istanbul, uh, was, had an index of 11,000 10 years ago. On the 3rd of May this year, uh, the index uh, went beyond 89,000 as Borsa Istanbul in its new name. And at the moment, it's actually, actually above 90,000. The interest rate uh, was 10 years ago, 63%. Uh, now, uh, the uh, borrowing rates for the state is six six and a half percent it goes down further and it is on a decline last week it went down to 4.96 percent and uh, it uh, is going down to 4.80. Ten years ago, the foreign currency reserves of the central bank uh, was $27.5 billion. Now, the reserves are $135 billion. On that same day, on the 3rd of May, there were two more important steps taken with respect to two in new large investments. We will be realizing a project in Istanbul. Before the elections, uh, I was expre expressing this as the, the crazy project, and this project, which I will tell you about, is or was one of those projects. This project is about building an airport in Istanbul with a capacity of 100 million passengers a year, which would put that airport amongst the top three airports in the world. It might even be the largest one. Uh, the reason why we need this is because the two existing airports um, do not meet the demand. Uh, there are delays and slots, and uh, planes are having to circle uh, uh, before being able to land. So we needed um, this airport. We knew that we needed a new airport. We were criticized uh, for this decision. Some uh, did not see the need for such an airport. We uh, looked into how uh, we could pursue this, and we announced a tender for a new airport for Istanbul with a capacity of 100 million passengers. There were four bidders, and one of the bidders, which consisted of five Turkish companies, a consortium of five Turkish companies, they won the... Uh, this standard with by uh, bidding 22 billion 152 million euros and uh, they will uh, be building and then operating the airport for 25 years and the cost uh, of this airport is 10 billion euros on that same day, the Japanese Prime Minister was in Turkey, and uh, as a result of our uh, meetings with the, the Prime Minister, we reached an agreement uh, to for them to build the second nuclear power plant in Turkey. We signed the agreement for that, and the cost of that investment is about $22 billion. So that's the magnitude, the size of that investment. Our first uh, agreement with respect to nu a nuclear energy power plant uh, was signed with Russia. So the second one now is signed with a Japanese-French um, partnership. And we have reached an agreement with them. The first signatures uh, were put on paper, and we will be building our second nuclear power plant with them.
I hope that the third one uh, will be uh, built by Turkish companies. Because the, these two investments will also uh, be important in further training our own uh, engineers and uh, business people, and it will certainly help them to improve their skills. So I've just given you examples of what happened in a single day. Uh, and in the ten and a half years that AK Parti has been in government, we have achieved similar uh, developments every week, every month. When we came to uh, power, Turkey's uh, foreign debt, according to its uh, or compared to its natural, uh, to its national revenue, was 74 percent. The debt to GDP ratio has gone down now to 36 uh, percent. But the opposition does not know anything about uh, the economy, uh, and uh, they keep claiming that our debt is uh, on the rise. And they only talk about the absolute figures of the debt. They don't compare it to our uh, GDP. Uh, they speak of absolute numbers. Well, if, if you are in debt, uh, we say, uh, that whips you into shape. So you, it really whips you into shape. And when you have uh, debt, uh, yes, you have to work hard to pay it off. Uh, what's important, however, is to look at the ratio, because the debt to GDP ratio has gone down to 36%, although it looks as though it is increased in absolute numbers. Uh, we are attracting a lot of foreign uh, investment. Our inflation rate was about 30%, but it's gone down to around 7% now. And we can continue to pursue this, uh, these policies, and our goal is to bring the inflation rate down to 4 percent. Ten and a half years ago, in Turkey, we kept talking about economic crises. Uh, there, were, uh, there was political instability, there were coalition governments. Until we came to government, uh, governments lasted on an average 16 months. Can you imagine? 16 months uh, was the longest they survived. I'm talking about the coalition governments. Sing uh, well, the single party uh, system in the first years of the Republic was different, of course. But when you have, an, on an average, 16 months in terms of uh, a government's uh, tenure, then you can't have political or financial economic stability. During the AK Party governments, we focused on two magical wor words. One is uh, confidence and the other one is stability. If you don't have confidence uh, in the the com in a country, or then you can't have stability. And so confidence and stability are very important, have been very important for uh, AK Party government. And we have... Uh, taken the state out of economic activity, and we have transferred all that uh, economic activity to the private sector. The uh, state privatized uh, the factories and other enterprises it owned, and the private sector took them over. National and international came in because we did not uh, discriminate or differentiate between uh, national and international capital. So we come into development um, and large giant projects uh, and new uh, development. R&D, innovation, tourism, these are all the areas where Turkey achieved great progress. We have another important investment coming up in Turkey now. This will be a channel, a, a canal, which will connect the Black Sea to the Marmara Sea. This is also one of ours, our, what I call the, the great projects, one of those important projects. And this uh, canal will be very important. It will be more important than the Panama Canal, the uh, Suez Canal. It will be larger, and the quality will be better, and its aesthetics, its architecture will be uh, very different. It will be a very different project. Uh, we focus on uh, two objectives with respect to this uh, project. One, we want to protect uh, the Bosphorus, which is an important uh, 
part of the environment uh, and a part of the beauty of Istanbul. As you know, at the moment, we have tankers going through the Bosphorus. These are large tankers, and we want to protect the Bosphorus, and that's why we want to create an alternative route. And they should not come through uh, the Bosphorus, these tankers, because the topography is such that there are eight uh, very sharp turns. And uh, if there is some sort of an accident, uh, if, if there is a malfunction, there could be a major uh, environmental disaster there. And uh, these those accidents would lead to a lot of loss. Some years ago, there was a, uh, a Romanian tanker uh, which caught fire and uh, it burned for seven, seven, seven and a half months. Uh, thankfully, it was not in the narrower part of the Bosphorus, but we don't want to see similar things happening in Istanbul, even if it's a chance in a million. That's why this Canal Istanbul or Channel Istanbul project is very important and uh, we are making preparations, we have made our preparations with respect to the bid for this canal and uh, I do believe that there will be significant participation in this bid and uh, we will be doing this uh, project through a BOT system. So, it, Turkey is not talking about the world now, the world is talking about Turkey. And uh, Turkey's success has made Turkey a very important country in its region in the world. It's very much appreciated as such. Let me also briefly touch upon a very important process for Turkey and for our region. We had made three basic promises to the people uh, when we first came to government. One, fighting against corruption. The other one, eradicating poverty. And the third one was um, fighting against um, prohibitions bans. In Turkish, all these um, pillars start with the word Y, so we, uh, with the letter Y, and that's why we call them the three Ys. Um, we have taken steps. Um, in all of these areas, and now we're taking a new uh, pro, um, step, which is a process for solving a ter the terrorism problem. Uh, it's a very vital, important process. Um, this process for uh, solving this problem, the ongoing process, will be very important uh, because it will have an important impact on social life, on democracy, on the, the economy of Turkey. We're taking a number of steps in this regard, and these steps also have a bearing on uh, regional um, stability because we can contribute to regional stability security in, uh, by solving this problem. Turkey has suffered terrorism in the last 30 years. Um, separatist terrorism unfortunately cost the lives of more than 40,000 people in the last 30 years, and the uh, financial cost is calculated to be around $350 billion. So Turkey has paid heavily uh, because of terrorism. But terrorism has also um, lent a blow on regional peace and stability, too. So as AK Party, we have always been determined in trying to resolve um, the issue of terrorism. And we have been fighting terrorism uh, in all of its dimensions uh, with determination in the last ten and a half years. And previous, uh, we have continued the, uh, this um, effort through our governments. And as we fought against terrorism, we also focused on the reasons under that underlie terrorism. We made major investments in the eastern and southeastern part of Turkey, which were neglected for decades. We realized democratic reforms, and we ended policies of discrimination, uh, denial, and assimilation. We could not have turned a blind eye to the regional um, discrimination that existed in the past. And we had three um, basic goals as we progressed in this process. We said that we don't accept ethnic uh, nationalism, regional nationalism, and religious nationalism. We won't pursue ethnic nationalism. Our population of 76 million people uh, are all equal and we uh, see them as e being equal to each other. We also said we won't engage in regional uh, nationalism because we believe that all regions in Turkey deserve to have development. So uh, 
whatever Istanbul is, Hakkari Van, the city of Van or the city Sinop of Hakkari uh, is the same. Or Sinop uh, and Hatay are the same. So we've made a lot of investment um, in these areas, investments which uh, had not been the case in the history of the Republic. So we continue to carry out these uh, investments with the same determination. So uh, we see spring in the air in the region, and this process of democratization has uh, done away with all the excuses uh, and pretexts that terror had in hand. And 63 wise people are uh, visiting all parts of Turkey in this process of uh, ongoing discussions about uh, resolving this problem. This does not mean that they are the wisest in Turkey, neither do we uh, claim that they are the, wi the wisest people. They are just um, friends, people who uh, got together around a, a common denominator, which is to work together to save our country from the scourge of terrorism. And so what they are trying to do is to try to contribute to peace in our country. What we're trying to do is to ensure that people can feel safe when they go out at night or the um, shopkeepers are able to open their shops every day knowing that business will be business as usual and everything will run smoothly. So this is what we are trying to do and the wise people uh, who are working in different parts of the country are doing that. They're not trying to convince anybody, they're trying to understand what the people think. Uh, they, they're trying to get feedback from the people. They, they include academicians, members of the media, artists, business people, people from the world of sports. They have gotten together around a common denominator and they are divided into seven uh, groups made up of nine people each and they are visiting their areas. They have been working for the last uh, 35 to 36 days. They have another two months to go and uh, once those two months are up, we, they will prepare their reports and we will uh, take uh, steps based on their uh, the information they uh, provide. For the last 30 years, we've always been hearing bad news every day because of separatist terrorism, but in the last four months, we have not had any incidents and there has not been any loss of life. There have been some, from time to time, uh, attacks on Turkey uh, because of the uh, conflict that is ongoing in Syria. But we know that this comes from uh, different uh, sources and they, it targets Turkey as Turkey continues to grow. But we have great hope today to bring terrorism to an end and we have greater unity, greater um, fraternity amongst us. And although it's only been four months since this process has been initiated, there have been important efforts with respect to developing uh, Turkey, because uh, we believe that we can pursue uh, our development strongly in an environment uh, which uh, does not have terrorism, violence and fear as its elements. And in the same way, uh, we will be able to discuss social and democratic issues and we can achieve a solution to some of those issues through social consensus. We also uh, know, and I'd like to remind you, that this process is open to a hijacking, sabotage um, and provocation. And that's why we are acting with great caution, uh, because we know that there are circles who do not want to see uh, Turkey become strong, especially in a turbulent and unstable uh, geography. And those circles uh, may uh, try to provoke uh, certain incidents uh, as we work to end, bring terrorism to an end. Turkey's new dynamism and broad vision uh, as Turkey progresses towards 2023 is also closely uh, observed and followed by the whole world, by Europe, by countries in the Middle East and elsewhere. This new uh, political philosophy of the AK Party 
this great change, um, the uh, importance and value we place on fundamental rights and freedoms, uh, the understanding of the state being at the service of the people, and the um, people-based uh, political approach that the AK Party has are all important aspects of uh, the great transformation which has been initiated by the AK Party. We see in our neighboring uh, countries uh, that Turkey has become a source of inspiration for the people who are demonstrating out on the streets for their democratic uh, rights. Our only goal is to ensure that there is lasting stability in the region. We don't want to export our uh, model necessarily, but perhaps we could be a source of inspiration for the countries uh, in our region. If Turkey is to become one of the top 10 economies in the world by 2023, Turkey can only do this if it works together with the countries in the region. And in our my meetings with President Obama yesterday, we talked about regional issues, international issues, and uh, as we discussed those issues, we also discussed the economic relations between Turkey and the United States and the importance of uh, taking that relationship to a new level. When President Obama visited uh, Turkey, uh, he described the relationship between Turkey and the United States as a model partnership. That model partnership uh, can add a lot to both of our countries. We have a clear vision uh, with respect to our future, and we have the uh, necessary means to achieve those goals. As a result of the work that we have been carrying out in the last 10 years, we can clearly see our future on the horizon despite the storms surrounding us in the region. We walk this path as a nation, we are determined, and uh, I believe that we will achieve this goal uh, of Turkey, which is in a leadership position, having solved its issues. We will never give up on our efforts for peace in the region and in the world, and we will continue to uh, contribute to peace in the region. We will strongly uh, defend democracy, human rights, and better conditions of living for the people. As a nation, we have always uh, stood together uh, with the victims and we've always been against the aggressors. And in our domestic and external foreign policy, we uh, work to defend justice. And this is the only reason uh, for which we work. Turkey is a country uh, which uh, pursues its policies based on human rights, democracy, and justice. And our goal is for all countries, all nations, uh, to um, achieve progress. And we will continue to focus on these principles. We think that a strong um, Turkey, which is a leadership position in the region, will be very important for the world as well. And we will continue to work towards this goal. As I end my remarks, I'd like to once again express my thanks to the Brookings Institute for having given me the opportunity to come together with you, and I thank you for your participation. And uh, I leave the floor to our moderator so that we can have uh, the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Mr. Prime Minister, we are very uh, proud to host you here as the Brookings family, and thank you for uh, accepting our invitation. Today is an important day uh, for me, too, uh, a day where I have achieved something I wanted to do for a long time. When you were mayor in Istanbul in 1994 or 1995, uh, you and I met at the classical um, car show, and uh, that was um, a reception, a 4th of July reception, uh, in fact, and we had met there. And as you have just explained to us, Turkey has changed a lot since then. The world has changed a lot since then. And the greatest part uh, of that change is perhaps that we have perhaps gotten to be a little younger, we hope. 
The most interesting part of uh, your speech was about economic change, uh, but that economic change has also had an impact on the region that we're in. And in Turkey, we sometimes miss that point. As Turkey changed, the geography surrounding Turkey has also changed in the sense that they have gotten somewhat um, they've become somewhat more prosperous and in the 60s and 70s um, Turkish people used to go to France or Germany to bring back foreign currency now people come to Turkey to um, earn some money and they send that money back to their countries in your speech you did not mention the constitution, the um, new constitution that Turkey wants to make. I, perhaps you didn't have time, but I know that there are people in this room who are very interested about this. There has been some debate in the media about um, the um, parliamentary uh, democracy versus a presidential system, and there have been a number of questions, discussions. Uh, could you give us your uh, views on this? Uh, in the Brookings tradition, uh, the moderator asks a few questions, then we will turn to the audience, perhaps we we'll get a few questions from them. Can you hear us? Well, first of all, um, I'll uh, make a statement about the new uh, constitution. This, um, the work for a new constitution has been going on for about a year and a half. And in the last election, all political parties actually made a promise to the people for a new constitution. The, we established a, as a commission to look into the new um, constitution to discuss how this new constitution could be uh, prepared. And we made a suggestion, a proposal for the makeup of this constitution. AK Party has, out of the 550 seats in the parliament, 326 um, seats. So we have 326. There are a few members who have passed away since then. Um, so I believe that all of the other parties have 222 seats, with just a few seats vacant. And um, these 222 seats are um, the total for three parties. We have 326 as AK Party. Our proposal for the makeup of the uh, commission was to uh, have uh, equal participation because so we have three members and the other three parties each have three members in the uh, in the uh, commission our goal of course here is to reap the benefits of this discussion so that we can achieve a new constitution and we can prepare a new constitution because what we have is a constitution that was prepared by the military regime and we want to have make a civilian uh, constitution. This is what we would like to do. But so far, we have not uh, seen a positive uh, approach from the opposition parties. If we had seen that, we would have made progress in the making of the constitution. The uh, main opposition party um, uh, made some proposals, but they made 150 propo um, proposals. The second uh, opposition party uh, made some about 140 um, proposals. The third, the other opposition party, they made, they tabled 106 proposals. We made 104. So far, we have agreed on 40 articles in one and a half years. The Republic has a history of 90 years. There have been constitutions that were passed, made in Turkey. 
We introduced a package of 26 amendments, and despite the opposition, uh, it passed from the parliament on condition that it would be put to vote, uh, and the people voted in favor of the, um, this, the that package of 26 uh, amendments by 58 percent, and those amendments were changed. Now, uh, those amendments were implemented, in other words. Now, it doesn't look as though we now have an opportunity to take this one to a referendum. But we will continue to be very positive in our approach to a new constitution. But I don't know how far the Speaker of the Parliament uh, will be willing to take this discussion further. My impression is that this process will probably come to an end by the time the Parliament goes in recess. Because the main uh, opposition party is uh, saying that there cannot be any deadline to the work of the Commission. But this I find to be not uh, very uh, serious, because you need to have a certain timeline in order to make preparation. Um, it might be a year, a year and a half, it could be something else. But if the Commission has an unlimited amount of time uh, to work, then it uh, waters down what you want to do. Uh, this we see, um, this approach we see in other parties too. So there should be some sort of a framework here. We should make a decision to complete this work, say, in a year, a year and a half, whatever it is. And I think the Parliament, this Parliament, has the necessary infrastructure to be able to complete this effort. Our universities are academia, they're all uh, prepared to work on this, but it's, they're trying to water it down. So uh, we are waiting to see what the speaker will say. The second question, uh, the presidential, the presidential uh, system. The late Uzal and uh, also uh, Mr. Demiral, they too um, discuss this. This has always been something, uh, a discussion point. And uh, during our tenure go in government, there have also been uh, discussions. There were questions posed to me by the media, and I had said that it would be um, good to look into this. I have said already that I'm in favor of a presidential system. I say it now, too. It doesn't have to be the presidential system here in the United States. There are in more than a hundred uh, countries in the world, developed, least developed or developing countries, there are um, there is a presidential system in more than uh, 100 countries. One could look at them and there could be something uh, that uh, may be prepared based on those experiences. Then it may either be voted in a referendum or it could be presented to the parliament. And then a final decision would be made. It is not uh, something that we must have under any circumstance. If uh, the parliament decides to move into this system, uh, then that's what will be done. We know how far the, the current system has gotten us. Uh, I think it has to be reformed. Thank you, Prime Minister. We take one question from the right, one from the left, and one from the back. Uh, uh, if there is time, though, at the very end, I would like to ask, uh, or uh, now I'd like to ask you a question about the EU, and uh, because I'm a former Jean Monnet professor, but I will take this to the last. I'd like you to identify yourself and keep keep the question brief, so that we can take two more questions. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Saeed Erikar. I'm a Palestinian journalist in town. Uh, Your Excellency suggested that the Palestinian issue was almost a domestic Turkish issue. Uh, I want to ask you whether Turkey will take an initiative to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli issue in the event that the current uh, US-sponsored effort continues to be paralyzed. Thank you. Thank you. You are right. We see it almost as, I can't say it's a domestic issue, but it is an issue on which we have um, great sensitivity as we would on a domestic issue. Well, first of all, the process of unity between Fatah and Hamas, this has to be achieved. If this reconciliation is not achieved, then I don't believe that a solution or a result will come out of the uh, Palestinian-Israeli discussions. So far, uh, Fatah has carried out those uh, talks, but no result has been achieved so far. Uh, you know the last Davos meeting I attended. 
At that meeting, when I was there, uh, I had a meeting with Mr. Blair uh, from the quartet, and, uh, and I had told him that uh, Hamas has to be around the table for peace to emerge in the Middle East. And after our discussions, he was on a panel, and he said in that panel that Hamas uh, should be part of this process for peace to be achieved. But since then, they have not managed to include Hamas. As you know, at the moment, um, there is a process of uh, reconciliation between Hamas and Fatah, and if that can be achieved, then I think that the uh, talks with Israel uh, would be um, moving forward more swiftly. As Turkey, I think there's a lot that we can do because we can talk to Hamas, we can talk to Fatah. Our brothers in Hamas, our brothers in Fatah uh, are uh, just as important to us. There's no difference between them. We are at the same distance to both, and we would like them, we want them to get together to uh, agree with each other. And uh, this would certainly uh, be important in Palestinian Israeli talks. The quartet is, uh, has four proposals, but I think the most important one, the first one, is the issue of borders, the 67 borders. Uh, Israel has to withdraw to the 67 borders. Um, when Olmert was prime minister, uh, we used to talk about this, and he was positive on this uh, border issue, but the governments after Olmert's government, unfortunately, are not very positive on this because of the makeup of the governments there, and uh, that's why they have adopted a different approach. I hope that common sense prevails, and this problem is in the Middle East is resolved. Another issue, uh, which we discussed a lot uh, with President Bush as well, the two-state solution in the Middle East. This has always been uh, important. There's always been discussions about this in Israeli state, a Palestinian state. But um, those who agree to an Israeli state cannot agree to a Palestinian state. Israel itself does not accept the Palestinian state. As long as Israel does not accept uh, Palestine as a state, then there's not much to talk about in terms of uh, trying to achieve peace, because peace can be made between two states. Uh, and those two states, with all of its institutions, all of its bodies, will be in existence. Uh, and that's important. Uh, I think that's something that we have to look at. Uh, the lady in the back, please. Arkada bir hanım var, kendinizi tanıtın. Kısa, kısa Nadia Bilbisi with NBC Nadia Television, Bilbisi Middle East Broadcasting Center. Mr. Prime Minister, the, according to the UN, the number of Syrian refugees has reached one and a half million. Some even put it at two million. Did you discuss a no-fly zone option with President Obama, and was he receptive to that? And if not, do you think it's plausible to do without the participation of the United States? Thank you. Çok teşekkür ediyorum. Thank you. There are close to 300,000 refugees in Turkey. About 200,000 of them live in 10 cities. About 20 to 25,000 live in container cities. And about 70,000 people rent homes in different cities. About 11 cities. They live in different parts. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of refugees in Jordan, uh, in Lebanon the same. So, there are also um, people displaced internally in Syria as well. With respect to the no-fly zone, uh, I would like to make one observation. This is not a decision that could be taken between the U.S. and Turkey. It's something that has to come through the U.N. Security Council. Now, um, there is, we are in a process of uh, holding a, a conference in Geneva. This will follow Geneva 1. And Russia 
uh, we know is taking part in Geneva II in this process. Uh, China, US, Turkey, the Arab League countries uh, will all be a part of this uh, process, but a timeline has to be announced for the Geneva process, and that process will have to be pursued. And if that process uh, Decides on such a zone, I don't know whether they will or not, but if that's what the process decides or if this is the outcome of the process, as Turkey we will also do whatever is necessary. The opposition in Syria is quite strong on the ground. Uh, so they're in a powerful position. In Syria, uh, the regime has a um, greater advantage uh, in the air because they use uh, missiles. According to NATO, they have uh, used 283 missiles. According to other information, they are using sarin, uh, the chemical sarin. These are issues that uh, we should discuss. They should be discussed in the UN Security Council and also perhaps in the UN General Assembly. There has just recently been a vote, uh, as you know, at the UN and uh, the General Assembly has stated its view that it's in favor of uh, looking into these matters. Thank you. Yes, please. You've been very excited about it. Please. <laughs> İsmi Murat Güzel, iş adamıyım. Amerika'da yaşıyorum. My name is Murat Güzel. I am a businessman in the U.S. I'll say two things and ask for information from you. First of all, welcome to the United States. Dünyadaki bugün süren zulmün, mücadelenin, insanların we see a lot of suffering, a lot of violence um, in the world, and this is because countries have some pragmatic approaches in their foreign policy. You, as a leader uh, in the world, perhaps for the first time, are also focusing on the human being, and you focus on justice, uh, and uh, the foreign minister is also expressing this, so I thank you and greet you with respect as someone who lives in the U.S. Uh, for your policy, because you, what you're doing is a new trend, being people-focused is something very important. Aynı All countries have to take this into consideration. Now, the second point. Dünyadaki insanların zulüm uğramasının ikinci sebebi de ekonomiktir. Ben bir iş adamıyım. Türkiye ile Amerika arasındaki çok istiyorum. Ama sizin her zamanki insan odaklı ve adalet odaklı ekseninizin ben bizler burada da lider olmasını şey öne geçmesini istiyorum. Çünkü şu an dünyadaki birçok çok uluslu şirketler her ülkelere gittiklerinde o ekonomik açıdan düşündükleri oralarda başka zahiyatlar yapmışlardır. Başka yatırımlar yaparlar. Bu dengeyi ancak sizin liderinizde olacağını nasıl ki dünyaya dış politikada en son olarak olacağını göstereceksiniz. Ekonomi anlamında da bu insanlara bu standartın bağını çıtasını yükseleceğinizi inanıyorum. Bu konuda size bir teşekkür ederim. Sunmak istiyorum. It's not a question. I think this has perhaps put people in a difficult two questions really quickly. Yes, and there was a lady. Yes, please. Very briefly, two quick questions together, and then the time will be up. Thanks. Jonathan Broder from Congressional Quarterly. Mr. Prime Minister, as you know, the uh, the uh, United States is, uh, and the EU are uh, implementing sanctions to uh, uh, pressure the Iranians to um, uh, abandon its nuclear program. And Turkey has cut back its oil imports um, in response. Um, Congress is expected to pass even stricter sanctions, uh, particularly against uh, oil exports. And I was wondering whether Turkey will be willing to cut back its oil exports from Iran even further. Thank you. Thank you. Very quickly, the second question, please. As brief as possible, identify yourself. Asl Aydın Taşbaş from Milliyet newspaper. Syria was the most important part of the uh, meeting yesterday. 
Before coming here, you said that uh, the Geneva process could be um, a delay, could create a delay in dealing with Syria. What is your view now? Uh, it looks as the United States is quite unwilling, unwilling to uh, take part in some action in Syria. So, uh, what is your uh, observation? One, you talk to or you see Mr. Kerry. Uh, he comes to Turkey quite a lot. What was your impression yesterday, especially over dinner? Uh, do you have any um, observation that uh, the U.S. is perhaps changing course in policy? It looks as though you view the Geneva process in a more positive light now. You, you seem to be convinced somewhat on the Geneva process. Why? Uh, do you see it as part of the solution? Well, with respect to uh, the sanctions on Iran, uh, we have uh, cut back on crude oil, indeed. Uh, there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, we continue to cut back. As you would appreciate, countries, nations uh, protect their interests and they take measures while they um, protect their interests. I, I would, of course, go to places where I can get crude oil or natural gas at a cheaper rate. This is quite natural for um, as a country, so long as I, you know, we find that source available. On crude oil, um, there has been a significant decrease in the amount of oil we import from Iran. The, when the oil minister came recently, we discussed this with him too. So we are in that process, and we um, we did say that um, this would be the case. Now, as to whether we will cut back even further, uh, it would depend on our need. It would depend, well, time will tell. So we will see. With respect to the Geneva um, process, I had said that uh, this would be uh, delaying things or deferring it further. Uh, indeed, I did say that. This uh, extension to the original uh, Geneva process you might say um, has had an impact on my thinking um, because uh, including Russia and China in the process uh, is important. Perhaps this could be something that we uh, can look into in the short term. Uh, President Obama uh, yesterday talked about a process without Assad, without Assad being included. This was one of the main titles of, the, of Geneva 1. Two, uh, having a transition government uh, with Assad in place uh, it cannot be a solution, and the opposition wouldn't accept it in any case. But now, uh, uh, we see the position of the Free Syrian Army, we see the uh, new structure of the national coalition. They will elect, they'll have an election um, on the through the 22nd through the 24th, so that once they make their election, they will also be uh, even more important and uh, with uh, um, a second uh, Geneva process with Russia and China included uh, finds our support. Thank you. Your question? We will perhaps talk about it one day. I hope not in 20 years' time. We would be too young then in 20 years, so I hope we do it sooner. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you very, very much.